I am really excited about today's guest. So I'm not going to go too deep into the modern people leader origin story again. We just had a couple of episodes ago, but long story short, in the early days of the podcast, I was I was reaching out to people leaders like Christine, and she just happened to be one of the people leaders that I reached out to. And she was nice enough to give me, I can't remember if it was like 15 minutes or 30 minutes, but back then my thinking was I want to do a bunch of problem interviews with people leaders and see what problem is worth solving and building a company around. Turns out I ended up just starting a podcast instead, and now this is my business. But um, yeah, it's 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 two years later, and Christine is is finally on the Modern People Leader. So yeah, we're really excited to have you. Thanks for thanks for joining us. Thanks so much, Daniel. It's totally happy to be here. Same here, um, Stephen. Glad to join you both and finally get this podcast going. I know. Well, thank you. Thank you for taking that that call with Daniel because he needed a few of those. So- decide maybe I should be doing a podcast and maybe I should have someone do this with me that has spent more time in HR and that ended up being me. So, (laughs) so thank you because we've had a lot of fun doing this. I'm excited about our conversation also. All right. So let's get into good news stories. And Christine, it's, it's basically, we all just share a personal or work-related good news story from the past week or two. Does anybody have Uh anything? I'll go first. I, yeah. I'm going to keep it real simple. And my good news is it's Friday and mm-hmm. Friday afternoon. <laughs> it's mm-hmm. been one of those weeks that has felt like two weeks, honestly. So it's nice to get to be on the other side of the work and to have a little bit of uh, rest and relaxation over the weekend. So that's my good news. I agree with you. Uh, it has been a long week. I'm going to kind of chime in. I'm also glad that January is coming to an end because I know you're in Texas, but I'm Mm -hmm. in Canada and we are in the heart of winter right now. And sadly in Ontario, our winters last about six months. So we've got a long way to go, but I always want to get through January and February the most. So glad we're halfway there. Yeah. I am struggling. So Christine, this is our third, this is our third recording that we're doing for the week. And it's hard thinking of good news three days back to back. So this good news story is going to be completely different than than the other good news stories that I've done this week. So I don't know if y'all are big HBO people, but there's there's a new show that's called The Last of Us. Yes. And I think a good portion of it was actually filmed in Canada. I could be wrong about that. But yeah, I'm really enjoying that show. It's like every weekend now I'm I'm looking forward to it coming out on Sunday. <laughs> it's and it's really good. Yeah, I, I, I've I only seen like the we were... first episode though, so I'm like dying to see the next. The second's better. Oh, <laughs> they're okay. they're like full movies. It feels like you're watching yeah. an entire movie every episode, which is fun. And uh, yeah, yeah, I I feel like we were in a TV drought for like a couple of months, yeah. so it's nice to have something that it feels like everybody's kind of watching together. Yeah, we can all talk about. That was a good one, Daniel. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> so. I'm I'm pretty familiar with your story, and I know you've had a handful of chief people officer roles. Is that right? Yeah. And you've worked in a bunch of different industries. I, I feel like you just have a really interesting story. So if you could just share with our audience, um, I guess as much of that story as we can fit in. Uh, yeah, give us give us your story. Yeah. So I've been in HR for quite a while. It's been like I think it's like 17 years. I've been in HR specifically, and. Um, I've been in a lot of different industries as well. I've been in food services and distribution. I've been in corporate matrix organizations. I've been in tech startup. And I would say over the past eight years, it's been focused on the tech startup space, primarily early stage startup. And when people usually ask me, hey, Christine, like, why do you always go to early stage startup? I think it's really because you get to build something from scratch. I've never really been interested in joining a company that's been around for too long and done everything. It's kind of like you go into the company, what are you going to do? What are you going to make better? And so for me, early stage companies really attracted me. I wanted to build something. I wanted to solve problems. I wanted to bring in the right people so we could scale the company. And like everyone knows, companies, every 50 to 100 people, you've got to change processes and you've got to start all over again because whatever you did a few years ago breaks and then you've got to start again. But recently, I joined a company called Nix, Canadian company. 
a famous entrepreneur, founder, and CEO that was on Dragon's Den, if you ever watched that. And she started a company called Nix. And Nix is basically an uh, intimates and leak-proof underwear company for women. And when I, when an agency recruiter reached out to me and said, hey, there's this really great opportunity, I'd heard about the company. I'd heard about the CEO and founder, Joanna Griffiths. And part of me was interested, but on, another part was like, no, I want to stay in the tech industry. Tech is more progressive and they, they, they're doing more dynamic things. And so I was a little bit hesitant about kind of moving into more of the retail space. But they pulled my rubber arm and said, just meet with Joanna. Like, as long as you meet with her, like, pretty sure that both of you are going to kind of see eye to eye. And sure enough, met her. Super fantastic. She really has a vision and knows how to do the grind to get the work done. And probably one of the hardest working CEOs I've ever worked with. But moving into this new industry, this fashion retail space was new for me. But the problems were still the same. Scaling issues. You know, how do you attract great talent? How do you scale processes? What we did like two years ago is breaking down. We need to implement new technology. We need new ways of doing things. All the same kind of problems that you go through um, during the same problems I went through during tech startup years. And so that switch made it a lot more easier for me. And I think that if there weren't problems to solve, it wouldn't have been as much fun. I can tell you there's a lot of problems to solve. <laughs> I can I can really relate to wanting to work for early stage startups. I think part of it is sort of being spoiled. The first job that I got out of college is working for Steven. And it felt like every other month I was trying to figure out something new. So first it was as an SDR, how can I figure out just to get people to res prospects to respond to us and book some meetings? And then Steven was like, hey, let's hire some more SDRs and you can manage them and figure out how to scale this process. That was also fun. And then eventually he was like, all right, we need marketing. I know you want to take on marketing, figure it out. So it was like, I had to figure out, you know, uh, paid search. I had to figure out social media. I had to figure out our website. Like, I don't know. So after having that experience and now having worked at a few different companies, there's nothing like building from scratch. I it's you just can't beat it, at least in my opinion. I guess you have to have the personality for it, but but I really relate to that in your story. Yeah, I think people who are comfortable with having a good level of autonomy and being comfortable with ambiguity, because the reality yeah. is like you can't if you going into corporate is like everything's set and there's templates and departments that take care of things and you're kind of in your narrow lane and you stay in your swim lane because that's the way it is in corporate life. And then you move into a startup space and you're like, what's going on? Like everything's so different and things are moving thousand miles per hour. But I've seen people like really struggle in on either side. But I've also seen people do really well on both sides because they can adapt to the environment. And so it really yeah. depends on your personality. Yeah, I guess for my personality, whenever I go into too much of a corporate role, I feel like my creativity is being stifled a little bit. Me but too. Me but, too. you know, some people like having their lane and being really good at one thing. So yeah, there's yeah. no wrong way to go about it. Exactly. So, so why should me and Steven be jealous of, of your day job as uh, the chief people officer of Nix? That's such a good question. There are tons of great companies out there and tons of companies with great cultures and building amazing things. I think that the thing that I think people would be jealous about is, again, working with a really world-class leader. For me, I think all companies do great things. They all have this great dream and they want to launch something. They want to build something for people and they kind of all have the same goals, but not all leaders are the same. You know, I always think that the leader at the top is going to set the vision. They're going to set how we work. They're going to help set how to build that culture and they're going to have a certain courageousness about them or not. And so when I'm looking around to see what opportunities should I look at out there, I'm very picky and choosy about the person that I'll be working with. And the person I work with closely is the CEO. And so Joanna is, uh, she is a force to be reckoned with. She's fantastic. Last night, she just won an award for Ernst & Young Best Entrepreneur Award for Canada. And now she's going to go off to mm -hmm. Monaco to, to kind of compete for the international win. But it's things like that where 
you know, time and time again, she's reinventing herself and really changing the trajectory of the company. And this is where I think like, not only has she built a company um, for women, with women, but she's done it with grace, courage, and that gusto. Like she doesn't stop going. She she makes us all work harder because she's the last one to leave the office at the end of the day and the first one to get in. Like she's constantly thinking about the business and you really have to admire that. I love it. I love it. And there's so much about your story that you've shared that that I relate to, but I want to dig in a little bit more. We had a guest last year, I think last about a year ago, his name was Jackson Lynch. And one of the things he mentioned was that HR organizations are highly variable. Like the work that we do is is largely the same, but how HR operates, how HR is perceived, how HR is positioned, it, it can be highly variable. And much of the variability comes down to how the CEO or the company defines the job description of the chief people officer. Like if you look at, um, you know, the top hundred companies in the world and you look at the job description of the CFO, it will be largely the same. Chief marketing officer, largely the same. CHRO, not so much. It can be very, very different. And I'm just curious, having worked in so many different industries, has that been your experience as well? Have, have there, has there been a lot of variability in terms of how you've been positioned and kind of the the experience of being a chief people officer for so many different organizations? Yeah, definitely. I think that when you think about organizations, they all have their unique culture, how they're going to work, how they're going to treat their people, how they'll build programs, what they'll invest in. And it. I did a talk recently to some students that were going to be graduating soon and joining companies for the first time. They said, like, what advice would you give? What should I be looking for when I look at companies? And I always say, Look at how they treat the employees. Look at how they build out the careers page online. Look at what they share on LinkedIn. Look at how the leaders operate. For myself, when I went into organizations, I could get a clue of what the culture was like by just walking in and just walking around and seeing how people operate. I'll tell you the quietest organizations where you walk through the hallway and it's quiet. You could hear a pin drop. Those aren't necessarily the best organizations. And I'll I'll tell you why I've I've actually been through organizations where it's it's been so quiet. Um, there was a sense of fear. There was a sense mm-hmm. like leaders are around, don't talk, put your head down. And I always got that shiver down my spine. I could tell something was off. And sure enough, when you join the organization and you build trust, people will come forward to share like, yeah, this is a really scary place to be. And I don't feel like I have that psychological safety. The best organizations um, with the best cultures, as you walk through the hallway, people are laughing. There's tons of talk. People feel really safe to share how they're thinking, how they're feeling, how to disagree when when their manager says something. And so even for myself, I've worked in organizations that are very formal. You have to be completely buttoned up. It's almost like you, you almost have to have a dress code and you have to operate a certain way. And that operating, the way HR operated in those organizations was was very firm, very formal. Um, Policies had to be adhered to, to a T, and you you, you couldn't stray from that. And then when you look at other organizations, it was very much about engaging with people. It was uh, trying to figure out how can we make our policies better? How can we continue to evolve? How can we roll out things that are progressive and risky so that other companies can look at what we're doing and saying, wow, they got something really cool here that HR is doing. We should try to do that at our company. And essentially, it's it's like taking those risks and allowing people to feel empowered and feeling innovative and feeling like they could speak out without being told to hush. And so I think even for myself, I lean more towards organizations that are more transparent willing to try new things. And let me tell you, when you try new things, sometimes you are going to fail. Not all programs launch and are successful, but that's what pilots are all about. And if you stop trying new things and stop taking risks, you become part of the status quo like everybody else. And who likes status quo, really? <laughs> Nobody. Not me. Yeah. Not me. <laughs> yeah. And and on on the point about the organizations where you walk in the office and you can hear a pin drop, I feel like the remote version of that is when you go on to a Zoom meeting and it feels like there's no energy. Nobody wants to say anything. Everybody's on mute. Their camera's off. And you're like, oh, like, this is sucking all of the energy out of me. So 
Um, yeah, it's it's so weird. Why is it so much more awkward on the Zoom call when when that low energy example? It's just like so painfully awkward, and it's like no one really wants to share, and we're trying to chit chat. I, I, you know what I think? Like when you when you're in a room, you can survey the room. You could see people's expressions. It gives you energy, and it makes you like want to say something. And then you see people smile, and then you feel more empowered. But when you're on a Zoom, you can only see a few people on the screen and you, you're kind of wondering, how is everyone taking my message? Are they engaged with what I'm saying? Is it is it kind of getting through to them? And so everyone starts to feel a little bit insecure. And, you know, that thing when people try to talk and four people try to talk at the same time and you're they're like, oh, you go, you go first, you, you're next. It's really awkward, like being in a large Zoom meeting. So I think this is the reality of the new tomorrow, the world that we're in right now post-COVID. In- And before we move on, after having worked as a chief people officer in so many different industries, what would you say was the one skill that served you well, having worked in such a diverse group of of industries? Like, you know, was there was there one skill that you kind of leaned on or, you know, what are your thoughts there? Yeah, that, that's a really good question. You have a lot of good questions. I think with that one, it's a little bit personal. So for me, I think at first when I fell into the role of HR years ago, I was wondering, is this really what I want to do for the rest of my life? The kind of HR departments I see are very bureaucratic and it's kind of like back office, you do your thing and every day was predictable. And what I found as I started moving into more senior roles and having that that you know, the ability to make changes, to have that autonomy and and have connections with senior leaders and try to convince them or get them to see like, here's how we could do things differently. And I realized it works because I think you need to connect the business goals with what HR is trying to accomplish. And I think sometimes HR is all about too much indexing on culture. I want to make people happy. I want to just focus on HR stuff. Whereas If you can connect all those great things and show why those things, if you focus on those things, you can also help the business. It actually allows the leaders to understand what you're trying to accomplish. So really tying in that employee experience with the business objectives is really key. Um, Don't just talk about, we need more snacks in the office, so we should spend $1,000 more per month. How about why are we adding more snacks in the office? Let's bring people into the office. We're a hybrid organization. Let's ensure that when they're in the office, they're feeling fueled and energized, and this will help them to be more productive. Tie it back to business objectives. And I think when you can see it more objectively, people start to think, oh, she's not just the flaky HR person who just wants to make employees happy. There's actually a business goal tied to that. And I think that's really important. Yeah, we actually... uh... I know we're not talking about DEI today, but we had Finley Howe on the show a couple of weeks ago. And one point that she was making was for your DEI initiatives, you should also connect those to your business objectives. She was like, why not use your your ERGs to help you innovate and create new products? Why not ask them for, for help marketing? Why not get their help with job descriptions? You can tie these ERGs and the work you're doing in DEI to your business objectives. And I think that's similar to the point you're making about all of like the culture things that that you do on the HR side. And I think it's so true. That's such a good point. We did start talking to our ERGs more. And what we said was when we roll out new policies or company announcements, there's times where we will kind of lean in and say, could you kind of take a look at this? Um, maybe our BIPOC ERG or our LGBTQ plus, and they'll say, oh, this language, we could change that, or let's tweak this so that we could be more inclusive. And I think, again, tying it to business objectives and creating this inclusive environment that serves both purposes to keep employees really engaged and happy, but also allow the business to grow and thrive. And I think sometimes people over-index on one side, but if you can find that balance, you have a really good win there. Did you at any point, have you spent any time in the business or have you been like a pure HR practitioner? I've only been in HR, like I'm sad to say, but you know, I've always been told by CEOs that I've worked with is you have this business mind, you're constantly thinking about the business. And so even at my last role at Notch, a tech company, we, we built software to help restaurants order their wholesale food supplies easier. And 
every time there was something going on in the business, whether it's sales related or finance, like I would kind of go in and kind of try to help there. And I think it's because I've always had this fascination with the business side, like outside of HR, right? I think it's yeah, that. I mean, I, I, well, that I was asking because that my, I had that same observation is like the, the people that come on our show and immediately start talking about how HR really needs to be connected to the business are the ones that really want to understand, okay, what is our revenue model? How does this, how does this engine work? What are the levers of the business that are, that are most important that are, we're most susceptible to? And, and I, I believe that that, that kind of mindset, that, that is a modern people leader in my mm -hmm. mind is someone who can look at the business in more than just the, the constraints of what we do, which is obviously really, really important, but it's not everything. It's true. I love that. Yeah, I was gonna say that's it's the it's the scrappy entrepreneur in you. <laughs> <laughs> Always wanting to learn more about the business. So you make for for a dream guest for us because you post so much on LinkedIn and it gives us unlimited content to ask you about. Like it was hard even narrowing it down to what you've shared and, and what we could dig into. But one thing that you posted recently that I found really interesting were Nix's aerial tours. So can you can you share with our audience what those are, how they came about, and what you've been able to learn from these? Yeah, for sure. Um so the term aerial tours was created by Joanna, our CEO. And what happened was I think we were in a meeting and we were really talking about how the economy has shifted. We went from this really strong market that we've had for over the past two years to this new reality. There's a lot of layoffs happening. People are feeling demoralized. A lot of companies aren't hitting their profit targets the way they had planned. And, and this is something that's unexpected because I'll be honest with you, a lot of companies out there were making their bonus plans, even double bonuses. Everyone was kind of on this gravy train for so long. And there hasn't been a recession in over 10 years. So a lot of people that have joined the workforce recently have never even experienced what a recession is like. This is shocking and demoralizing for a lot of people. So I think we felt it internally at Nix. You can feel it. People were feeling anxious. They weren't even sure, are there going to be layoffs? Is there is something going to happen so we could preserve the business? And Joanna, myself, and some of the executive team members were talking about this. And we said, you know what, at the end of the day, when people are feeling insecure and you could feel it through the organization, it's affecting the culture, the best thing that you could do is talk about it. And so she suggested, why don't we go do an aerial tour? Let's go to each department and we're going to allow people to ask questions, like submit questions beforehand, or just get on the Zoom call and talk about things that are on their mind. It doesn't necessarily have to be about the environment, the, the recession, the economy, but something that's really been troubling them. And to be honest with you, we got a lot of feedback. People were really comfortable talking about it. They appreciated the fact that we took the time to do these meetings. And I think it was like Joanna and I went back to back nine meetings in a row. So it was going from one meeting wow. to the next. It basically took the whole day. And um, we had our people team members taking notes and it was it was like this like tour that we were taking, but so much came out of it. Trust, people felt more confident. We answered the tough questions. We talked about there is going to be no layoff and never has been at the company and we're going to make things work. We talked about, Yes, our profits aren't where it should be, but here's what we're going to do to kind of offset that. And let's also talk about the wins that's going on in the company. And so people came out of there feeling more confident, appreciating leadership, leaning in. And that tells you that connections are more important than anything. And I think sometimes we've forgotten about connections with COVID, the remote work, people feeling isolated. We're only now starting to get back into the office to try out this new hybrid model. And so the connections were lost. And I think that helped people to feel connected again. So that was our aerial tour. And so it was nine meetings in a row on one day. Yeah. How were how were these meetings structured? Like how many people were invited to each meeting? How we long tried were they? to keep the group small. Okay. So if if there's a really large team. And let's say there's 25 people, then it would just be for that team, like max 25. If the teams were really small and there's only like three or four people in each team, we might combine it with another team so that there's at least eight to 10 people. That allows people to feel more comfortable. They're with their peers and they don't feel like, oh my God, it's just three of us in a room. I think it's just trying to get people to feel comfortable to share what's on their mind. And 
the agenda was open. If some people didn't feel comfortable and they wanted to share questions in advance that were anonymous, that was okay too. But what I find is when you get people to talk about the hard things together and, and you answer those questions in a transparent and authentic way, you don't have to always rely on anonymous questions anymore. People will feel safer to say like, you know what, I have a question. Are we going to get our bonuses this year? Like these are things that are top of mind for people in a tough economy. And I think it's healthy to answer questions that are that people are thinking about. So it was a lot of getting people to share what's on their mind and then also trying to create some action items out of those. And some really great ideas came out of it. Like, hey, when we do our update meetings company-wide each week, why don't we talk about some of the wins and we could rotate and, and have each department share something new each week. And we're like, sure, why not? Like, we have to be optimistic as well. We can't be all doom and gloom. And so a lot of really good ideas came out of those conversations. And, you know, uh, scrolling your LinkedIn, there was something else that that caught my eye. And I think we've, we, we've talked about this a couple of times on the show. It was a post about how CEOs often mistakenly think they can hire one person to sort of do it all, do both HR and talent acquisition, but that in your opinion, they require their own specialized skills. Can you, uh, can you give us what was going on in your mind? Yeah, you this, that? this, this is a conversation that's ongoing. I think people go yeah. through this all the time. And I think sometimes when CEOs or founders are starting a company, they think HR and talent is the same thing. You must be doing the same thing. And the reality is, while it could sit on the same team, like our people team has a talent acquisition side and we'll, we're all part of one team, the reality is the skill sets are vastly different. When you think about the work that HR does, it's not necessarily the same as talent. They really do have to have a background and experience to be subject matter experts in things like compensation, employee relations. Like if you're going to give people advice about how to deal with a disability or, or, you know, something that relates to discrimination. How do you do that if all you've done is recruiting? Like this takes years to practice. And I'll be honest with you, there's no school that you go to to learn employee relations. It's, it's years of experience that you build up so that you understand how to give advice. What are the right things to say? How do you not trigger people? How do you hold confidentiality when, when an investigation is going on? These are things that are really, really hard things to do. And I'm not saying that recruiting isn't hard. On the opposite end, I know a lot of HR people that cannot and do not want to recruit. Recruiting takes a lot of energy. You have to ask the right questions. You have to know how to source the talent because you don't just want passive talent. You want to source the best. And you're really a brand expert. You're really going out there externally to talk about what the company does, what are our values, why should you join our company, what's in it for you? If you join our company, what, what, what can you expect over the next few years and how are you going to get that growth and development? All of that is like selling the opportunity that your company can provide. And it takes a tremendous amount of energy to do that. You're often going to be working outside of regular hours when you're in talent acquisition because your LinkedIn never turns off. So people will be pinging you in the middle of the night or on weekends. I saw that job posting or, hey, can I connect with you virtual coffee to talk about this role? It's continuous. Yeah, it, it feels like it's sales in a lot of ways and you're dealing with rejection nonstop. So if you're someone with an HR background that's that's not used to that and now you're being a task with both HR and recruiting and you're having to deal with that, that might not be as fun for you. It, might not it won't be sales. fun. Yeah, it, it is I, like sales. I, I think and there's a big risk, <clears throat> excuse me, of, of failing, you know, not doing either of the jobs really well. Because, you know, on one side, you're getting overwhelmed and your energy is being drained if, if you don't, if you're not wired that way. And so you're depleted when you need to do the, the employee relations and all the other stuff that is involved in the people function. And so I think that can be a really, really tough combination if, if you get the wrong person trying to do both. You have a really good point there because some CEOs think I'll just hire one person make them build out all the HR programs, create an employee handbook, do the compensation planning, do employee relations and do recruitment on the side because we have 40 roles open. And it should be easy because it should be one person that can manage all of this. And that's not possible. That's like saying, I'll have one <laughs> engineer do front end, back end, uh, QA, and, and they're going to manage all of that. Not possible. So really, <laughs> there are two skill sets. And 
people typically tend to want to do one more than the other. There are some people that love to do both, but they tend to lean closer to one side. I'm going to switch gears a little bit. And we've recently talked a lot about Gen Z on the show and how younger generations are are bringing are going to bring more change and the expectations that they have and i i also got lost in your linkedin page because there's so much great so many great posts but yesterday you posted something that just like i i had i we have to talk about and that that was a post around career oriented people and it, it seems like the younger generations are definitely very career oriented but you you describe how many people early in their career at a certain point, this is probably early to mid in their career where they start to push back on doing tactical work and they want more strategic experience. And I love what you had to say. The post says, if you haven't executed on enough ground zero work, you won't find a job where you'll succeed in strategy alone because you just don't have enough experience. That is a tough lesson to learn and nobody wants to hear that (laughs) mm -mm. Mm -mm. it's like finding out when you're a manager that you don't that you still have to do the detail work Mm -hmm. you're just expected to manage on top of that and so what uh advice do you have for for people that are early in their career that are kind of struggling with this where they it feels like you are just being fed a lot of grunt grunt tactical type work and and you want to position yourself for strategic work like how do you do that in a way that isn't so that you won't come across as you know um naive right mm-hmm. yeah I'm curious what your thoughts are there yeah i think i've heard this for a while it's over the years it, you 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 get that knock on your door you know i i want to ask hr a few questions i've been in my whatever, let's say finance role for a couple of years. And I hate doing all that like journaling and and journal entry and all the basic accounting stuff. I want to do more strategy work. I want to be able to like go to strategic meetings and like strategy sounds like this really fancy thing that people do. And the reality is the strategy incorporates understanding all the tactics to ensure you build a strategy that works. When you're too early in your career and and you want to jump right into strategy or you want to move into, let's say, even like an executive role. And let's say you've been like a manager for a few years. The reality is, is when you're not ready for that role, but you're chasing titles and and salary and, and all that glamour that comes with joining a position that's two notches above you, the person that really struggles at the end is you. And the reason why is you're ill-prepared for that role that requires competencies at a certain level. So a manager's competencies are going to be vastly different than an executive's. And so if you want to become that VP, you're probably going to struggle. You're going to have higher accountability. If you can convince your manager that you're ready and they give it to you, God forbid, but it's happened. Um What's going to happen is that you're going to feel that stress. It's not going to be fun going into work every day. And I've had conversations where managers have come to me and they said, oh, you know what? I I thought like this person's zest and and their energy meant that they could handle this level above them, but they're clearly struggling. And unfortunately, we've had to let a few people go because they can't manage the expectations at that level. And it's it's funny because sometimes when when you're having these tough conversations with people and you're doing that exit meeting, they'll say, well, it's not my fault. Why didn't you give me a mentor and training? And why didn't you ensure that I had all this experience? And why didn't you pay for someone to do all this stuff for me? Like, I don't understand why. Like, this is why I failed. And I think it is not your manager's responsibility nor the company's to give you all the things to fill in the gaps that you have. Your gap might be so big that Nobody can sit down and hold your hand and teach you how to become that VP because you took the leap too quickly. And so I say, really think about where you think your competencies are at and when you feel that you're ready, because jumping the gun is going to hurt you at the end. As what? Go ahead, Daniel. No, I I was just going to say, like, as someone that's more senior and, and looking at your direct reports and thinking about who to promote and who not to promote, what? What are they typically looking for? Like, how do they know if their competencies are where they need to be for for that specific role? Mm -hmm. I would say there has to be the skill set, the competency of like 
are they ready for this role? Are they actually punching above their weight right now where you're thinking, wow, this person's a manager, but they're really working at a director level. There, there's also the, the maturity level there. And I don't mean by age at all. It's really about your behaviors. Are you mm -hmm. able to handle confidential information without sharing it with your friends by the water cooler? Are you able to have full accountability for your role where, hey, if you have to work on it all weekend because there's a town hall on Monday morning, that's just what you're going to do. Because it doesn't get easier when you kind of move up the ladder. It gets much more difficult. No one's going to tell you what to do and no one's going to give you a time schedule to say, here's here's what your schedule looks like next week. You've got to figure it all out. You've got to plan your time. You've got to figure out the strategy. You've got to make sure that you roll something out that represents what the company is looking for. And it keeps getting harder and harder as you're moving up. But don't jump two steps above because at the end of the day, that stress is going to create that anxiety. And again, you're not going to enjoy your job. So I do look at people who are taking on more, who seem to be really comfortable taking on higher level work where you kind of give them a stretch assignment and they're killing it. Like, you know, they're crushing the work. I feel like they're ready. And that's when you have that conversation like, hey, do you think you're ready for that next level? I see a lot of growth and development that's occurred over the past few months. And I want to see if you feel that as well and have that conversation. And then I think that's when you start to see like, hey, this is a this is going to be successful. I can feel it. What I was going to say earlier was I I learned the lesson of being careful in how you sell yourself and then subsequently being accountable or owning up to the way you sold yourself. And I had two corporate jobs. I worked at Ernst & Young and then I worked at, at Goldman Sachs. And my first manager at Goldman, I'll never forget my first feedback session. And Daniel knows the story, but you know, her, the, sh the feedback, it was, it was the shortest feedback meeting that I ever had with a manager. And it was by far the most direct. And all she said to me was, Steven, you sold yourself as a Ferrari and you're more of a Cadillac <laughs> and a Cadillac is good, but it's no Ferrari. And I was like, ouch, like, oh, <laughs> and you know, she was right. You know, it, 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 and I, it was, it was hard for me to swallow that and looking back, it, it was really, really painful, but I, I can see it clearly now. I can see how I, I sold myself as being ready for something or just like at a point in my career that I wasn't quite there yet. Mm -hmm. And I had been a, a, you know, a, a medium fish in a really small pond. And now I was like this medium fish in a really, really big pond and big lake. And it, it was just a different ball game. And I think that it takes a lot of maturity and it takes a lot of awareness around about how have I positioned myself to get this promotion and how am I actually doing in the job? And I, I don't know if everyone is ready to own up. You know, today I feel like it, there's a lot of wanting to blame other people to mm -hmm. your point, like, oh, well, this is the company's fault for not giving me everything I needed exactly the way I wanted it in order to me to be successful. Yeah. Talk to any hardworking entrepreneur or founder. They're looking for people that can roll up their sleeves, do the work, do the, the crappy work, like I said in my post yesterday, and be open to more strategic work, but also to not be afraid to learn new things and stretch yourself. You don't have to jump ahead to prove to everybody, hey, I got this really cool promotion. You've got to really prove yourself. You've got to feel confident in what you're doing. And that takes time. And so speaking of rolling up your sleeves, so you've been, your current position as Chief People, People Officer at Nix, you've been there for about three months, right? So you, you've been in that zone of rolling up your sleeves. Can, can you tell us a little bit about what goals you set for yourself in those first three months and what that, what that process looked like? Yeah, with any company that I join, I usually try to take a step back and just quietly observe the room. I want to get to know the team members. I want to get to know the CEO, the executive team, and I want to get to know the employees of the company. I always find that people who go into an organization and they're like, bam, 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 bam. They want to like make all these changes. Sometimes they're making changes for the wrong reasons because they don't understand the lay of the land yet. So a uh, great book, The First 90 Days. You should try reading that book. I read that book years ago and it was very much about observe, learn, talk to as many people as you can. Then as 
right now, I think I'm just about to hit my third month. Around this time, this is when I'm starting to think about what are the goals I want to hit? What are the biggest problems that the people team can solve? Um, and there's low hanging fruit. There's things that you could achieve quite quickly. And there's other things that take a little bit longer. You have to create a strategy and there's going to be some change man management involved. But the reality is, is how do you solve problems first so that everybody can say, this is an amazing experience from executives down to the intern. And I see quite a few problems that I think I could solve right away. Immediately, I started to think about some of the OKRs that we would establish for the people team. It was a little blend of how do you enhance the culture? Let me look at the engagement survey that rolled out last September and see what the biggest problems were. Am I seeing a theme? Is there something that's continuously coming back as a theme? And yeah, for us, it was very much about like, how do we ensure we have clear communication? There was a little bit about the tech stack that needed to be improved, which is easy. You just implement like the right tech stack. It's That's the low hanging fruit. But the more strategic things is how do we work together in this new environment? How do we move towards asynchronous um, communication? How do we ensure that we still have connections with people? Because um, three years ago, the company was only 40 people. And through COVID, they're now 270. So the, the growth that occurred in this completely remote environment created a lot of silos. And there weren't a lot of people that had met each other. So a lot of that was part of the strategy that I was drafting out for the next two quarters. Can you can you give us a little uh, view into to what that that looks like? Yeah, I, I think I look at what's broken, what's not working, and so what they had was weekly update meetings. They're quick, half an hour, kind of talk about what's going on in the business. The reality was those just having those weekly meetings wasn't enough. In thirty mm -hmm. minutes, can you really? get information across to the entire organization. We have retail staff, we have HQ people, we have people remote in the US. Are you really sharing the information that we need in that quick half hour? Probably not. Um, so what I thought was, let's do monthly town halls as well, where we go deeper into communicating what's going on in the business, what's going on with other departments, what can we share so that everyone's on the same page? It's something that that simple, you can get that started right away, but really allowing people to really think about what's important that we're sharing to the company, because this is our company. Like we've all committed ourselves to being here for the next few years. And so you really want to feel like the information is flowing. It's transparent. We know what's happening in real time and there's no surprises. There was also a struggle that I saw that's very typical with companies that are scaling and growing at a rapid pace. You have your frontline, like, employees, individual contributors at the bottom, and you've got your executives at the top, but you have that sandwich of like the director level leaders. And they're not at the top, they're not at the bottom, they're kind of in the middle, they've got to do a lot of execution, they've got to take the information from executives, but they've got to get the individual contributors to kind of do the work and all do it together. And there was a little bit of a disconnect there and information wasn't flowing clearly enough to the director level things would be announced at town hall that directors had no idea about and they would be blindsided. And then employees would be asking directors, what was that all about? And the directors would think, oh my God, I just found out too. I'm not sure. That caused a little bit of a communication break there. And so what can we do to create um, director meetings that are really interactive and we could talk about the hard things that we have to execute on? Like, are we going to get bonuses this month? Like, those are things that are hard to talk about, but it's important to talk about it because if we don't, then people will talk about the water cooler. So uh, I guess similar to what you said, there's like the work that needs to get done, the, the low hanging fruit, and then you have like more of the long-term strategic work. Maybe that's like the more exciting work. Is there, if you had to pick, you know, one thing that you're most excited to tackle in, in 2023 with your people team, what would it be and why? With my people team, I really want to create an environment that's willing to take more risks. And the reason why I say that is HR typically is known to be like anti-risk because they're dealing with a lot of, of the problems that occur in the company and they're doing it in the background and it's it could deal with litigation, it could deal with discrimination, it could deal with all the scary things that could happen in an organization. So typically... HR becomes very reserved in terms of making sure the boat isn't rocking too much and nothing falls apart. But what I say is 
you can't predict everything when you work with people because people are unpredictable. We're emotional. We come in all shapes and sizes. We think differently. And the reality is, is working with people is a risk. Something could always happen. Even when you, when you try to make the perfect rules, things are going to happen. And so what I say is take more risks to try new things that work. Not every company is the same. You can't say Netflix does this, so we should do it too. That would be great, except for the fact that we're not Netflix and our, our culture is vastly different from Netflix. So try doing things that will work for your organization, understand your people and the culture that you're trying to build with the executive team and take the risk to try new things. Do these pilot projects, launch something that no one's ever done before. Ask your employees, what do you think about this? And get some feedback. Trying new things is okay. And I think that's sometimes that's just a scary thing to think about when you're when you've been operating in the people team in a certain way for so long. I love that 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 you can't predict everything when you work with people because people are unpredictable. <laughs> that has one thousand percent been my experience. So true. No, I, I and I was just gonna say, um, I love that giving your your people the psychological safety to to try new things, to take more risks. Are y'all thinking about ways to, I guess, create a forum for people to bring new ideas to the people team? Or is it more on an ad hoc basis? Maybe you haven't even gotten this far yet, but um, that's... I do talk to a lot of people on people teams externally because I mm -hmm. want to see what's going on like outside the company. I always yeah. find that when executives are only thinking about their company, they're siloed in this nutshell and you're not looking at what other companies have done or even failed at learn. And so I do join a lot of other um, networks. I'm on different Slack channels. I'm on a CPO group called CPO HQ, which is really fantastic. They have this confidential forum where we can share ideas or even templates or policies. And we, th we could talk about like what worked for you and what didn't. What do you think about this new hybrid environment? Should we mandate coming into the office certain days or should we say as you wish? talk about a lot of things that we're all going through. And I think you have to do that being a CPO and, and trying to come up with new ways of doing things. You've got to talk to people outside the organization as well. So I do do that. And then I also encourage members of my people team to do the same, build your own networks. If you're a manager, build up a network with other managers. These are your peers. These are the people that are doing the same work that you're doing, going through the same struggles. And I think without having that strong network, you're going to have to reinvent the wheel all the time. You're going to have to build a policy about attendance because you didn't talk to other people that said, I have a better one that you can use. It's really important that we have this open source in HR so that we're, things aren't siloed the way they've been all through the past 20, 30 years. I think it's it's now coming out in the open that being you know, open source, sharing information and sharing our learnings is the most important thing you could do to grow and develop faster. I'm old school. And so I'm all about networking and relationships. And it's just so interesting. Like I, my partner, she's younger and she's in talent management for a 12,000 employee company. And I really admire how she, even in their fully remote and how she has created a peer network of other managers and she's intentional and she invests time. And I, you often hear like how hard it is or it's impossible to network because the way we work is so different. Um, and I, I see another example of how you, it's not impossible. You can actually do it. it. It might be more difficult or more challenging or just, a, you know, different, different format that you need to do it in, but just seeing how she is advancing in her career, it's, it's huge. And I think it's a, it's a, really big miss opportunity for some people because there's just no one's doing it. Not as many people are doing it these days, at least in my opinion. And so I I love that that recommendation. And unfortunately I want to dig into all of that more, but we've reached that time in the conversation, Christine. It's time for us to uh to turn the corner into and to wrap up. But before we do that, there are a couple of traditions that we have. The next segment is what we call our rapid fire questions. Same three questions we ask every guest on the show. And so my first question for you is, how do you define a modern people leader? What are the traits and characteristics? Yeah, that's a really good question. I think a modern people leader is someone who really thinks outside the box, takes the risks, 
is willing to try new things and is not creating that, that cookie cutter model that most HR people rely upon. It's, you'll see the ones, you probably know about the ones that are modern people leaders. You've heard about them. They're on LinkedIn, they're cutting edge. And they're actually talking about the really, really hard things that make all of us uncomfortable because they're willing to talk about it. That risky side of them wants to talk about things that's really hard. And so I think you can all recognize one of these people in your network or within LinkedIn easily. Love it, love it. Next question. If you could go back in time and talk to a 22-year-old Christine, what career advice would you give yourself and why? Yeah, I, I think when I think about some of the advice I got when I was younger, the advice I would give today is be wise about the people that you ask for advice from. <laughs> because <laughs> some of the people that I asked advice from, I wouldn't have asked for advice if I knew the kind of advice that they would give. They didn't really, they weren't very successful today in terms of they told me, don't take too many risks. You got to stay safe, stay at a company for as long as you can, because that's how you're going to have longevity and grow. That was not the right case for me. I stayed at the, the company that I stayed at the longest was like six and a half years. And the growth was really slow in that because it was a corporate company and they had these guidelines and rules about how you could get promoted. And when I finally took the risk to break out of there, my career took off, taking risks, doing things that were outside of the box, listening to people that were doing the same thing. And, and then I wasn't so scared anymore. So be careful who you ask for advice from, because sometimes it's not the best advice that you can get. <laughs> well, it's one of that. Yeah. The, <laughs> be selective. <laughs> uh, last question. If you could fix any HR people problem with a magic wand, what would it be and why? I think it's to talk about the hard things. And what I mean by that is HR is typically is known for confidentiality. So they keep things hidden. It's the scary word of world of HR. And sometimes even HR folks don't share what they're working on. I always say, talk about the hard things because this is how we're going to learn and make change. And if you look at some of my LinkedIn posts that had the most activity, it was the ones that talked about really controversial things like why don't women support other women to become leaders? Women never talk about that. And I remember one woman reached out to me on LinkedIn and said, oh my gosh, I can't believe you posted that. Did you get stoned to death? Did people send you these rotten messages on LinkedIn? And I said, no, like nobody sent me a rotten message. Everyone said, that's true. I've noticed that myself. And I'm questioning, why is that? Why don't most women help other women to rise up and get to that leadership level? And so like what I say is for HR folks, talk about the hard things, talk about things that people don't talk about, because this is what's on people's minds. And typically CEOs, um, they want to know how to solve these problems. So if you're talking about it, they probably want to talk to you about it as well. Stephen and I have been thinking about like what the mission of the modern people leaders should be. And we've gone back and forth on, on a few different descriptions in I'm like, maybe it should just be, we want to talk about the hard things in HR that, that no one else is willing to talk about. And it's tough finding the right people that want to come on the show and, and do that. But um, we, yeah. we've literally seen what you just said, Christine, like play out in the conversations because we'll usually have some form of prep, either like we'll meet or we'll do it asynchronously. And you can see how, like what the notes what we've agreed to talk about, how it slightly changes. So yeah. I, I think that would be a good mission. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe like hot topics, right? <laughs> yeah. Maybe that's maybe that's a recurring, you know, segment that we we end up adding or something. Mm -hmm. But um Ooh, I like that. Yeah. So you mentioned that in your in your mind, the modern people leaders out there are the ones that you see on LinkedIn. They're doing cutting edge things and they're the ones that are willing to talk about the hard things. So is there a name or two that you think of that you think they should go on to the modern people leader? Like these are the people leaders that I'm looking to on, on LinkedIn, or maybe you're meeting with them in person. And I know that they have a lot to share. To be honest with you, there were two, but they were already on your show. Oh. <laughs> so I said, Oh darn. So you had Lars. Yeah. So yes. I, I'm a huge fan Lars. of Lars. I, follow him and bought his book. And anytime people ask me, can you recommend someone to follow? It's always Lars for me, but also Katie from HubSpot. I think she's just done some amazing things at her organization. I look up to her and I admire her very much. I can't think of anyone right now at this moment, but what I would encourage you to look at is, are there any CEOs that there 
that have an HR background that moved into a CEO role. Mm. I think that would be really amazing because I want to hear about like that intersection between like, you know, business goals, business objectives, and then the HR background. How did this person bring it all together? And so yes. there's I think one that person, would be really good. Yeah. There's one person that comes to mind for me and I'm blanking on her name, but I think she was formerly the CHRO of AT&T and now she's the CEO of the Mavericks. And Steven, that's that's Steven's hometown, Dallas. So he's, he's a huge we'll Mavericks fan. So we'll maybe see. we need to reach out to somebody like her. Do it. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so we end every episode with one word or phrase close where we all respond with a word or phrase from the episode. And um, I'm going to go first, and I'm keeping it simple. I'm going to say Friday. Love it. I'll say take the shot. It's all about the risk thing. <laughs> yes, yes, Christine. <laughs> I, I'm going to go with talk about the hard things, you know, I, it, it will get easier if we just all start talking about them a little more and it'll get less scary too. It's so true. Agreed. Well, <laughs> well Christine, this is awesome. Yeah. And on that note, thank you for, for being vulnerable and for having courage and like everything you do, at least what we see on LinkedIn and this conversation and talking about the hard things with us today. It's been a really, really amazing conversation. And thanks for res responding to my cold DM on, on LinkedIn two years ago. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> I love it. Thank you so much to both of you, um, Daniel and Steven. This was so much fun. And maybe we could do it again in a few years. Yeah, so. yeah or sooner. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Have Alrighty. a good weekend, guys. Thank you. Bye. Bye.